My name is Bronwyn Alsop, uh, and I'm an early childhood educator, um, and I am uh, 40 years old now, um, and I have two children uh, who are seven and five um, who have disabilities, and I'm also chair of uh, Voice for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Children. Um, due to my uh, five-year-old uh, being diagnosed uh, at eight weeks with hearing loss. So after his diagnosis, then I got actively involved and um, I've sort of redirected uh, my sort of education side and, and my passion all towards disabilities overall, and especially with um, ADHD for myself and my daughter as well. Yes, I am a big advocate um, in the community for multiple things. I'm not uh, I'm also the founder of Ontario Families Coalition, um, which I had started with no plan or any agenda, but when COVID hit, um, I think really purely due to my ADHD, I, I dropped into a severe depression um, because I had no structure, routine, um, and my daughter was probably four at the time. So I was watching her, or maybe yeah, she just about to turn five. So she was unraveling, I was unraveling and both having ADHD. It was just very hard uh, for both of us. And um, I'm also a child abuse survivor. Um, my mother um, had severe uh, uh, personality disorder and schizophrenia and a severe garbage hoarding disorder. Um, and I uh, lived with her um, until I was 12 uh, in a privileged neighborhood. I went to a private school until I was 12, um, or I guess a little bit older, but basically for me living in a wealthy privileged neighborhood, um, but living in disarray, it, surrounded you know, by uh, a dysfunctional home and uh, verbal abuse. I was not a child that was safe. And that was really uh, rattling, like rattling me throughout the media and just very, uh, there's tons of parenting groups that I belong to. And everyone was just sort of on this whole mentality of, you know, schools um, aren't safe, uh, but they were saying kids are safest at home. And for myself, I would not have been a child that was safe in those things. So I, I kind of just went on a whim. I created this Facebook group uh, for advocating to have schools open um, after the first lockdown, because uh, there was no plan laid out from our government. And then it just spiraled into me being in the media all the time. And then I ended up um, sharing my private story about my mother and how the courts took me away through my school and how school is my safe haven. So that I've always had those advocacy skills in my hands and I use it all the time, but that was the first time really uh, the media had sort of reached out to me randomly and then I became a public figure, um, which I, I didn't plan, <laughs> but, but, it, but it happened and here we are. When were you first diagnosed with ADHD? Um, I was actually formally diagnosed in my second year at university. Um, I um, attended a private school until grade eight, um, and then I went to a public school after I moved in with my father because uh, of the high costs. He didn't want to pay for it anymore. Um, and I found um, in areas that I was really, um, that I struggled with a lot was math and science, French. Um, anything in that sort of area of geography, I really struggled with those. And other areas where I thrived was more um, expressive through arts, so in English, um, you know, drawing, acting, um, and that sort of area of history I loved. That was more my thing. And then when I went um, in the private school, I always struggled academically sort of across the board because there was I wasn't diagnosed. There was always discussions that um, my focus was sort of, I would be that child who would stare at the window and sort of get distracted. I was very well behaved. I didn't have any behavioral issues, um, but because my parents were going through a very long divorce um, when I was six, um, there was a lot of resistance from my parents on agreement on what to do. And I think um, my educators were sort of get caught in the middle um, and also being a private school I, in that time, um, I, it was always a very competitive thing you know, in your marks and grades. So I don't really know if they had the appropriate um, tools and resources to really know how to even get me assessed um, like they do now today. So I think I should have been diagnosed definitely when I was younger, but I think it just kept catching up to me where you know, I got into university um, in things that I was good at. But then when I got there, the overload and overwhelming experience of just everything was, was just too much for me. It, it was, um, you know, there was the social aspect, which I loved. But then there was the constant sort of um, struggle to have routine and things and, and listening. I've, I've really struggled getting through all the reading uh, in, the, in the materials, um, which I had always done before, but sort of gotten by. Um, I've never been tested for dyslexia and I really don't think I do have it, but I struggle 
with my focus from the top and then I go all over the place. So I lose focus. So uh, that's when I think that my marks were dropping. So they referred me to have a psych assessment uh, through the school or through the university. Um, and also at that time they diagnosed me with anxiety and depression. And I also went to Luke, um, discovered I had a hypothyroid. So all in that year. Um, and that's when they put me um, through the process of getting more accommodations, a note taker. Um, Kurzweil was a program that was offered to me to use uh, with all, all my programs and, um, and various other accommodations that were amazing to have. And I also was then, um, how can I explain it? It was like a light finally went on where I was very happy to, to have this sort of come to, uh, you know, a label of some sort to understand. Um, and, and also frustration, uh, resentment that this hadn't happened for me earlier because I was sort of always struggling. And, and it was like, you know, I was that calm, well-behaved child and no one really ever labeled it. So I was frustrated that it had taken this long. Um, and then I, I was also embarrassed by it, I guess. Telling people about it was really hard for me. Um, I was very vocal about my other conditions, my epilepsy and that kind of stuff. But I, I did struggle with this because I didn't, um, I don't know, it's just a hard thing to bring up. I really did. And then eventually I'd say um, after university, my marks were struggling um, to third year to really catch up. I think it was too late. So I then left uh, my third year and then I went to George Graham College um, to do culinary arts. And then I worked in that for two and a half years. Um, and I didn't like the industry. So then I left that and then went back to George Brown College to be an early childhood educator. Um, and I really found after that transition of understanding from university going into George Brown was where I knew exactly what to advocate for, what I needed. And I went in knowing the appropriate accommodations and not feeling ashamed to sort of speak out about it. Um, and then I was more vocal about it. Um, there was a lot of um, struggles in that time, I guess, still. And then, um, and it's also not something that many people get it's so hard, right? You know, to, to explain to people and your, your professionals and, and you know, your educators um, and also in your workplace, they don't always understand it. Um, so that, that's, there's always that level of stress. And then um, I had uh, my daughter, um, who was uh, born, uh, I guess, in 2015. And then I saw as an early childhood educator and living it with myself, early signs. So um, that's when I really went on a full force to uh, promote early intervention for families and to try to not be a repeat child like me that's later diagnosed where you could have gone so much farther if you had had all these things uh, given to you accessible in your early years. Um, and, and that's how I, I started this. So now I'm also an early intervention coach. I felt a lot of shame and embarrassment. Um, it really affected my confidence. Um, I felt like I was never good enough. Um, I felt like, you know, what, what's wrong with me? You know, like I, I knew I had so many skills and some things, but it's like when I was anxious and I was doing something that I didn't feel confident about, I would just freeze. And it's like, I couldn't even get past doing it. It, it was just, it was a mix with my focus and anxiety. And, and especially in, in times, um, where tests, like if I was doing tests, there was always this huge heightened anxiety and distraction with the, the room and the environment um, and this pressure of, you know, I, I'm going to be the last one or will I get there? And, and just sort of this like anxiety would just take over. Um, and that was beneficial in university where I would, um, in college, where I would have uh, like the test the extended time alone and I could do things as I, I wanted to sort of to get through it. And I always did, and I did well. But before, with that sort of pressure, with everyone watching and knowing that I was struggling was really hard for me. So it was a lot of shame and, and confidence issues. And, and I guess also being in a private school where you're around um, quite a mix of people, you know, who are, you know, academically, um, you know, you know, you're all a mix of people, but some people were like, you know, very, very in a different uh, journey academically than I was. Um, and so it was hard and, and no one came, you know, it was in my head, but it's something that does build up. And I think also with educators, you know, being in grade one, I remember um, I was always that kid who was sort of at the table by themselves, maybe with another kid. And we were always sort of brought there for more extra support. And I was like, why am I always here? Like why, you know, I'd see my classmates all doing something else. And I felt 
segregated, I guess, but I didn't really know why. And then my mother, because of her mental health issues, um, she she used to make fun of me a lot. Like, and she she was, and, and like, oh, you suck at math, or she she would just say, I don't. It, it was her mental health was a whole, you know, really difficult thing to deal with. And I don't think she ever meant any direct harm to me in the way she was, but it was her personality disorder. So, um, for her, she did not like to deal with anything. Um, that was a lot of work for her. She, she liked to sort of take things that were perfect and easy, and she would sort of take that as her only priority to talk about, um, you know, if I was good at something. But if I wasn't, then it would just be like a joke, like, oh, you, you, you're bad at math, don't worry, it doesn't matter. Like, she would brush it off, or she would tell me the negative things about, uh, not the negative, but the things um, about my class, uh, I guess, what do you call it, report cards and things. And also, it, it just wasn't done the right way at all. And my dad always wanted um, to try and do everything uh, added to support, but it was just this constant war with the two of them that whatever he said, she would argue, um, and vice versa. Um, and my dad actually also has ADHD, which is not formally diagnosed, but pretty 100% sure that's from him. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, so it, it was it was hard. A lot of psychological uh, mess on that. And it still haunts me to this day with a lot of things. What are some of the biggest obstacles you have faced because of your ADHD? I'd say it would be getting general instructions sometimes one on one. Um, like, for example, um, I finally learned and I don't know how, but like if I was missing something in a class or people were giving instructions, if, if I was having that confidence to sort of ask, you know, can you repeat? And you do it again or to to sort of uh, not like if I didn't I would just sort of let it happen and I would forget not forget I would try it like I didn't want it to be known that I needed a repetition with it um, and that was embarrassing for me so uh, and also having that determination to be honest that I was struggling because I didn't know what my label was and and, and in the 80s and 40 you know ADHD was always I don't know it's getting better, I think, but it was like, you know, the kid who was super hyper and behavioral issues, like in they said ADD or um, everyone sort of threw the labels around like, oh, they're on Ritalin, like, and I didn't even know what that was, but it was a lot of shame around it and embarrassment. So and, um, I, I really struggled with that, I guess, with emotional issues, but that in my tests in my classroom um, and being um, honest with how I was struggling with things and, and um, that was a big thing for me. And, and especially those tests, like we would have these, um, these, these routine tests all the time um, called the green tests, you know, the little dots that you have to fill out. It's like an yearly academic thing that the government does. Uh, and I used to find those very stressful. And every time I'd look at it, I'm like, oh my God, and I dread it. And then I just hated it. And the whole thing was just a, an awful experience for me um, and just missing out on things. After receiving a diagnosis and treatment, what were your thoughts? It was to medication um, because of my other existing medications with my epilepsy um, and also my hypothyroid and stuff like that. And I was also put on an anxiety med for depression as well. So uh, they've put me on Adderall and that I'd say was the, um, was a negative for me. I, I was not, um, I was never anti-medication because I've been having epilepsy seizures since I was 12. So that was sort of not a big fear thing for me or my parents, really. I'd already had brain surgery. So it was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> We've been through this. So here's the drug. But I found the side effects really hard. Um, and I didn't really uh, come in tune to it until um, later, I guess. Like I felt like my head was just spinning all the time. Like I, I think it was helping me to some extent, but it just really... I had never done, you know, weed and that kind of stuff and drank, but I felt I'd never done crack or something, but I, I felt like my head was just constantly spinning when I was on it. And I lost a lot of weight, um, which um, at the time I've had two kids now, so, you know, it's a different thing, but I lost too much weight and, and I was really, it was affecting me that way. Um, and then I, I found with the accommodation, so the medication, I didn't really ever know it was helping. I, I didn't know that part, but the accommodations were with having the extra time for tests um, and for um, a note taker, uh, as well as extended, um, I guess, deadlines on things that needed. Um, at Kurzweil was a really good program. Um, the only thing I would say is that there was a level of anxiety with it that I couldn't always 
uh, get through. Uh, it, it was sometimes because it was a new program to follow. Um, but but I I really did find um, in the end it was beneficial and, and also to not look at the professor or whoever was uh, giving any sort of directions um, because I would get distracted and I would start you know inspecting her hair, or dress, or outfit, shirt, whatever, and and then I would go into another world. So I had sort of got this tool and I, I think I came with this on my own that even though I had the note taker, I didn't look at the professor the whole time. I just typed everything in my phone um, or tablet or whatever I had at that time, then I would get it all. And then I could go through it back after and pick it out. Um, and that was beneficial to me. And um, and now I uh, audiobooks are amazing for me. That's how I really retain a lot. Um, and then to go through things after and have things after it's in di di digital, I will have it like read to me after. That really helps speechify. That's a newer one. Um, yeah, so that's what I, I really benefited from, I think, the accommodations. It, it, it's harder hands-on, though, um, just to to still ask people in daily life, you know, just for, you know, in my job now, if I have someone, a colleague, and they're saying something, and, and you don't have that uh, trust that they're going to understand always, what, what you know, that you need to have that reminder. If there's too much overload at once, then there's that anxiety with it. And, um, and still, with anything you ever apply with now, um, on you know for applications or jobs you always have this chart now of your gender uh, of your um, background your, your and everything and do you have a disability and every time I see that with ADHD my was doing that for my son it would be an easier thing because it's a visible disability and he's deaf and he's got hearing aids um, me I always hold back with the ADHD I guess I still have that anxiety with it, are they going to hire me if I tell them that? Um, and that's where I, I still, it is with me and I'm not sure if it's there just for, to be looking like we're politically correct and throwing everything out there or is it really gonna affect me getting that job? Um, so that that is the harder part. Um, and um, when my daughter was diagnosed with uh, her ADHD uh, last year, um, because I had gone off Adderall actually when I was pregnant, I, I had, it wasn't interacting with another medication well. So I probably went off Adderall and then I was off for it for quite some time. And I enjoyed uh, how my body was reacting better to it, um, like off it. But then um, when we were told about her diagnosis when I heard medication, I immediately got anxious because I thought I didn't have a good experience on Adderall. So I want to sort of be the guinea pig again to see what is out there that will be better. So since November, I've been on Concerta again and uh, or a new drug and it's been really beneficial. Have Kadak's resources been helpful for your ADHD? I have started, I didn't actually know about Kadak until I'd say um, maybe four or five years ago. So it was around my daughter's sort of in the beginning process of her being diagnosed. And, and um, I, I didn't know um, anything about the programs as well. And I think that's also across the board because of my kids with the hearing loss um, and my daughter having sensory processing disorder and all these things. I really wasn't aware of all these support systems that were out there. For my epilepsy, I did know that there was epilepsy Toronto. Um, I had reached out, but to be honest, there was never um, a lot uh, support or programs like like you were offering um, and then also when I got involved with voice um, and then I became chair and things like that so that's how I think I, I really didn't know all this existed until I was sort of immersing it with other areas and then that's how I came I think to discover you so then now I, I was uh, following and definitely being um, getting I, I've actually become sort of the PR person for you behind the scenes, but spreading awareness in communities for parents, because, you know, it's like a motivating thing, um, but, or for anyone, like a lot of adults aren't diagnosed and there's a lot of still shame with it. And, um, and parents really struggle with getting through that barrier, you know, what it is worth the assessment. So if you promote these things and whatever you guys have shared things, and I put it everywhere for people to see, um, just to bring awareness that these things are up there. So, and, um, and I also follow, I don't know if you don't dig a little deeper on Instagram, if you don't, uh, she's amazing to follow. So she's a psychotherapist who uh, specializes in ADHD. And um, she also has different psychotherapists um, that do coaching and training and she's phenomenal. And, and she actually had a webinar, uh, not webinar, sorry. Uh, she has a podcast and last week it was talking about the mental health 
uh, people who are raised around mental illness are often very much uh, to be high probable cases of later diagnosis ADHD. And that is myself, you know, I think it's genetic as well, but my father was also physically abused um, by his dad, hitting and verbal abuse and um, would really pushed him to move out of his home. Um, and he is ADHD for sure. So it's definitely a, a huge connection and, and I'm fascinated how it's all together. So I, I've loved everything you guys have been incorporating. How has your experience been in the workplace? Uh, it comes back to the comfort level. So some people I have shared it with later on, but I haven't been that vocal about it. So um, I've always been very cautious about it. So when I was in the food industry, um, it wasn't as big a deal because I sort of did my own thing, I guess. So it didn't really affect me, to be honest, as much as with my ADHD at times. Maybe when I was hearing things coming in and out from staff or uh, employees, or uh, it would have been harder. But it was really, I'd say, um, when I was working in, as an early childhood educator, um, you know, if you miss certain things, you know, just details and, and you need to go over some things. Or um, I don't do well unless something if you tell me everything just on the spot and I have to walk away and remember what it is, I struggle. It's just the anxiety that that was my focus um, combined with the ADHD. So I prefer written things uh, by email or written down to me and I have it as a reminder and tell me. So it, it has been a struggle. When people that I feel comfortable with, um, when I was working as an EC at Bob Rumble Center for the Deaf, um, when my son was diagnosed, um, they, a couple of my employees were also my friends. So they knew different things with the accommodations that I was talking about. They were also parents with the other kids who were sort of going through this process. It was easier. It was like you were in a comfortable place to talk about it. Um, but with uh, different, with my new, you know, different locations, I, I still, they know my daughter has it. I've always, you know, I'm a big advocate for it in the community. I'm sure my, my boss on Facebook, um, um, I know, I think she knows for sure. But it still hasn't really clicked or understood to, to them. Um, I think I've talked about it, but it, it th there's no movement for um, caring to them. Like it's not. It, it's I, I've gotten by it. I've been all right. It doesn't really been a big deal. But for me, it has. It has been. Sorry for. I haven't messed up, but mentally, it's been a strain on me because I'm always keeping it back. And even now when I'm applying for other jobs, um, I'm looking for career change and looking to go into different things. And, and again, as I tell you, every time I see those forms or in an interview, um, I'm so, I feel like I'm doing a disservice because I'm so big on advocacy and you know being open and fully genuine, but then I am scared. I won't get that job. Um, so it, it is still very much a big problem. I didn't, I, I guess it was, I, I mean, my colleagues I would talk about it with, like ones that I trusted. And, and so it was an easier thing with other people that I didn't, I would be sort of more quiet with it. I'd say as I've gotten older, it's been easier that way. When you're younger, it's very different. Um, also, um, it's just, it, it, you have to build that trust, I think, to, to, to tell them. And I, I don't know why that's so much like with AD, I guess it, it's really a deep-rooted psychological thing. I, I know with other things, you know, with my epilepsy, I have seizures. So and, and to be honest, my seizures were never an issue to people until once I, someone did see them. And then three days later, I was let go under contract saying that um, your English was not up to par. And, you know, it wasn't anything to do with that. It was that they were scared. I saw they saw the seizure and they looked at it as like a an issue for them. So I was gone. So I guess that was the only time with the epilepsy, but I, I was always easier to tell people that. Um, but the, the ADHD, I guess it's still hard and discomfort. There's a discomfort for sharing it because you, you um, I don't want to feel that, but I just want to make sure um, they understand I won't fail them in what they're doing. It's just part of who I am. There is such a lack of awareness in, in everything across the board. So uh, in deaf culture and, and like um, in ADHD and sensory processing disorder. People don't even know what that is half the time. And I didn't know that before my daughter was diagnosed. So it's really, people need the constant education and awareness on all disabilities and especially ADHD and to break it down, you know, how this can work and it can be accommodated. And, and you know, these are the tools that you, you need to have in your work just as much as um, I, you know, I'm a very strong advocate for accessibility. Um, for my kids and myself, 
um, and for like, we don't have it on right now and I don't need it, but like closed captioning, um, that is something automatically, you know, in the deaf and hard of hearing community, if you did not have that on there, um, it would be looked at as a huge sort of faux pas if you did not ask for, you know, to look with, with that kind of thing. And, and sort of that should be the same um, in, in with ADHD. No one thinks about it because no, no one gets it. They don't really understand it's a real thing. So I think that needs to be put into all workforces. Like we, we are, we have so many diversity, equity, and inclusion committees happening now um, since 2020. But what are we really doing with it to cover everything equally, and um, and to do it properly, and to um, you know put ADHD at the top as well as being deaf and, and other disabilities. I don't think we're doing a, a good job of that yet. And uh, even in my school, my daughter's school, I'm on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and um, I have to be honest, I've been frustrated with, with both, like the, the um, with abilities, it's just pushed aside as, as a high priority right now, and, and both all areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion are very important, but people still aren't putting the amount of time and in bringing it into the education and awareness for their professionals. Um, it's pushed aside right now and other things are always paramount on top. Um, and I think they both need to be at the same level. Has your ADHD changed with age? Um, I'd say after I was overwhelmed still just with because you're getting all these resources and things and adjustments, it, it's good and it's a lot of overwhelming things. And I was very isolated with being around anyone who had ADHD. So I think that was also a part of it. So I think as I've got, uh, as I, I'm older and I've connected with more people who have it myself, um, like myself, I've become so much more comfortable with it. Um, and I've figured out how to survive doing it. Um, and, and I'd be very open about it, you know, in my life, um, you know, except for the work barriers and that. But as we said, but uh, I'm all my friends know, all my family members know. Um, do my in-laws get it? I really don't think so. Still, it's like they don't, you know, whatever. But um, I'm very open and vocal about it. So I think it's yes, I'm doing better with it, and especially having. My daughter now diagnosed with ADHD. I still don't think people understood why I was pushing so hard to get her early diagnosed. Um, it's not like I was like, oh, I want a child that has ADHD, but I saw my child who had it when she was like three. Uh, at first, we thought she could be on the spectrum of the sensory issues, um, but then that was ruled out that there was, you know, something definitely with the focus. And, and I was right, and, and I'm an ECE, so, you know, I also could see these things. Um, so and people, you know, still would think I was nuts, you know, like just almost thinking like she's obsessing too much about this or she's, or my in-laws would say, oh, you know, don't worry about it, that kind of thing. And, and that was probably um, what kept me going and going to sort of keep doing it to make sure we didn't do a disservice to her. Um, and also, um, I think, yeah, I think that that's so as an adult, it's been uh, better for me. Um, I, I just think now as a parent, this is the trickier part when you have ADHD and you have a child that has ADHD and you're observing similar things that you went through, um, not in the same severity of trauma because with me, I get anxious. So watching her go through the struggles and seeing like a complete replica of me, um, I do get very uh, or just anxious and sort of like, it's hard to switch off and not be so wound up with things. Not because I'm upset with her, but it's like, I, I want her to, to be okay, supported. And, and I feel like sometimes I can't do that um, or, or in structure. Like I know she needs a hell of a lot of structure. And, and when she doesn't have programs and things and tons of routine, then she falls off the rails. So that's another thing um, that myself, that I know I need a lot of structure and routine and her, but it's hard to always get people to understand that. And that's costly if you think about it for a kid when you're paying for all these programs and things to keep them constantly engaged and entertained and structured um, outside of their school, that adds up a lot. So when you're, you know, in your marriage, that's an issue <laughs> to talk about. They don't totally get it from a professional side always. So um, I'd say yes, an adult side, living with it myself, uh, but the anxiety and stress of these things, just raising a child with it has been uh, a, a different journey that I've been working through. 
Do you think if you were diagnosed earlier in life, you would have a different life path? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah, totally a hundred percent. And that is why I was such a strong advocate for my child. Um, and I knew exactly what was happening. And, and I think that's the problem. I, I also think, and this is the other part, I have a long wish list um, because parents don't, I'm a different type of parent. I lived through it. You know, I knew the barriers of not being diagnosed earlier. Many parents have no idea they have ADHD. They don't even know what it is. They don't want to know their kid has ADHD or any disability. There's a huge other slew of things that come with that. The developmental set assessment is not mandatory. Um, but when a child is born, their hearing is automatically tested after birth. They have a prick in their heel to see their genetic conditions. Uh, at three years old, you are not forced to get a developmental assessment. It's only done by choice if a parent or if a pediatrician refers it out. Same with the assessment for ADHD. That should always be put out there. And I know that's money and I know that's funding and they don't want to test every goddamn person because that's going to cost more. But what do we do again with that pot of people like myself where there was that issue um, where it needs to be addressed? And that's where the advocacy side is that I, I wish I'm an early intervention coach for this whole reason to try to motivate parents, you know, to try to get through that barrier and that anxiety and depression of, you know, what if my child is diagnosed? Well, if your child is not diagnosed ever, they are going to struggle for the rest of their lives. If they are given the appropriate early intervention from as early as possible, you are going to be setting yourself and your child up for future success and knowledge and education. And that is what we need as well. And we need to figure out a way of um, to, to tackling that barrier uh, from an emotional side for families, but also from financially to make it easier. Because you know, everyone has their teeth checked. Everyone has their eyes checked. All these things are checked, but everything that happens in your brain doesn't happen until it's too late, unless you have a seizure or unless it's a physical thing that is a safety issue. Safety issues, ADHD, you can risk safety issues. You can fall into severe depression and anxiety. You could do things, I was reading actually in your newsletter, driving. You know, you could screw up behind the wheel with your ADHD and go off into another thing. So it, it's the earlier diagnosis needs to happen and there needs to be ways of making it happen in, in a way that is going to help make it easier for the parents to decide um, and make it more accessible, like all um, services like T. What are some of the biggest misconceptions about ADHD? Uh, behavioral issues. Everyone always sort of generalizes that there's an automatic behavioral issues that you're always going to be acting out or be that person, you know, especially when you're younger as a student, it's, you know, sent to the principal's office or whatever it is. Um, the other thing is just, you're not going to be uh, up to date on tasks and goals. You're going to fall behind. You're going to be that person who needs the constant handholding. Um, the other side, I would say, uh, would be the anxiety piece with it, I guess, just trying to, that's, sorry, the other barrier, I guess, is trying to just get through that emotionally and, and to understand that you're not always going to be free of it. I think you have to come to a permanent acceptance that this will live with you forever, like anything, and um, you have to learn that this is a long-term journey that you have to constantly cope and work with. And, and thinking it's going to be like a one hit wonder five weeks and you're done is not realistic. It's, it's a journey. Um, I've had to, different things. I've had someone say to me, oh, everyone has ADHD. And, and that cuts me off. Um, and I said, well, you know, not everyone has it. Because if they say that, I feel that they're just saying, yeah, it's not a big deal. So if you say everyone has ADHD, how is that going to go at a ministry level advocating? So I, I, I don't like that mentality. Um, and I, uh, or people, yeah, I don't like that. As far as the medication side or, or when, um, when people would, sort of reference back to someone that you who was on Ritalin and sort of make a joke. I don't appreciate that. Um, I, I remember that more when I was younger. Um, more, uh, some adults would say things like that, like cracks and things that weren't appropriate. Um, also, I guess, um, I'm trying to think where else it would be. Uh, I guess overall, I guess just in, 
yeah, those would be the two main things for me. I think those are the areas. I haven't really had specific names. It's more when people just say they brush it off and they think that it's not a big deal. And, and that's usually their way of, you know, saying it's too much work for me to accommodate. Or um, or, or if you're talking to someone, they, they think it's too much. I have had a person who has ADHD herself uh, um, and she sort of, she, she's not as vocal about it, but she kind of brushes it off. Like it's not as big a thing or she does say sometimes everyone has it. And I think everyone does have a layer of attention issues, but uh, it's not, I don't think it's appropriate. I don't like it. So I've, I've usually called it out if I can. How do you feel ADHD has benefited your life? Uh, I'd say so. Yes. From a strength and advocacy, I think anything um, in your life and also for my kids and understanding the system. Um, yeah, I am so thankful that I have had these things in my life, all the barriers health-wise, including ADHD, um, so I can be an example for uh, sort of future generations to sort of uh, try to do everything I can on my part um, to bring awareness and, and to help us go forward, not backwards, or not just stay where we are. I don't like that sort of sitting with it for this long and not doing anything, so I, um, I, I really think I am I, I am thankful I had it. it you know, do I, as we said before, do I wish it be earlier? Yes, of course. Um, but you have to accept everything in life the way, in my opinion, it's dealt. And if you spend too much time um, not accepting the reality of what was laid out, you're going to have more barriers uh, for your life going forward. It does hit you. You always think, oh, I could have, but it, it's, it's important to try to bring yourself always back to where you are, but it does hit you. You're not gonna be perfect. What do you want people watching to know about your ADHD? Uh, for myself, I want people to know what they're with my ADHD. Um, personally, I, I want them to know uh, that I am there always to support them and to have their back if they ever want to reach out to me, um, especially to um, be there because you need people around you who have been through this together to have support. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And to try, if you can, um, to build that um sort of level of, uh, I guess, strength to try to keep advocating for the community. I think you just need to keep going and do everything you can um, as a way of coping and handling your own diagnosis um, and coming to an acceptance of what you have, but also to try and shift it. So to, I know many people struggle with things where they get very down and depressed and in a negative state where they can't even cope to realize or understand their diagnosis and they push it away try to embrace it and take it in every way you can to help and support the community as well to make them improve in, in their life and future development in any way of all ages. So I think if D, I'm not, if you're feeling low and down, everything is valid, everything is important, but there are ways we can help get out of that in, in a way of positively helping others in our community. And I think if it's too much negative energy um, on, you know, focusing on the negatives of this and not going forward, then we're not going to have any success.